Hello, I'm Dr. Caroline Jeffra, and I'm very happy to be speaking to you today during Exarch's first ever all digital conference. It's great that this documentation strategies conference could adapt and forge ahead and participate in a really encouraging outpouring of shared research during the pandemic that we're all facing together. I've been doing experimental archaeology for the past 15 years. In that time, I've worked on a lot of different questions, questions which may or may not have been a primary focus of the research I was doing at the time. I've also spent a fair bit of that time outside of, outside of academia, pursuing questions that I was interested in answering, but not necessarily interested in or had the time to publish. I've seen firsthand that my experience is a common one, as a group, people who do experimental archaeology may be specialists, or we may be into, into ancient technology. We may be archaeologists dipping a toe in to answer a very specific question, or we may be people working in a museum or another institution who want to speak directly to, to the general public. There are so many ways that people are contributing to experimental archaeology. But as an experimental archaeologist, I keep coming back to a problem that I think that we've all confronted in our own ways. Experiments are activities that, if left undocumented, they can't help our field move forward and ask new questions. On the one hand, not everyone has the interest or the desire to publish their experiments within the peer-reviewed journals that form the backbone of traditional academia. On the other hand, many of us aren't working within academia at all, and we're stuck on the wrong side of journal paywalls. There are a range of alternatives as well, a vibrant community of people who share their work in any number of on online platforms. We can check institutional web pages, personal blogs, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, forums, academia.edu, and ResearchGate. This list can go on now, and it will go on as we go into the future. I've run into a few issues with these, but it boils down to two, standardization and searchability. The realities of each of these formats lead to lots of disparate and non-comparable information. The overall effect of this is that it's a bit of a mess for someone who, for example, just wants to answer the question of what experiments have been done about using an organic material for tempering clay. Today, I'm sharing an alternative route. I built the register for experimental archaeologists as an informal and interconnected repository. Here, we can capture basic information about ongoing and completed experiments regardless of their present or future publication status. The focus here is not to replace publications, nor is it to say that our current online reporting and sharing should be abandoned we would be much poorer if either of those were to happen. Instead, the main drive of this effort is to give a platform for people to share their work quickly and easily, where they can refer back to all of the other publishing formats and build a searchable and categorized repository which expands through time. I'm going to use the rest of my presentation time to show you how to use the register as it exists today. First, I'll show you some of the ways of browsing through the register. After that, I'll get into more detail about how to add information about your own experiments. <clears throat> Before getting into more detail about the register, I do want to extend a very warm thank you to Ruland Pardekoper of Exarch, who has been a great sounding board throughout the development process. He was also kind enough to give me the information about a batch of articles published in Exarch Journal over the years, and those are the starting point for what you'll see in the register over the next few minutes. The register is a media wiki located at registerarchexperiments.mirehese.org. This is all probably very familiar, but I just want to take a moment and highlight that here you'll find everything to get yourself started. From this page you can browse categories, quickly start adding new entries, and reach out to help out in more substantial ways as well. Let's start off with a basic search and return to that question of what experiments have been done about using organic material for tempering clay? Just from the welcome page, I can go right up to the search bar and type in temper. My search returns three results here, and you can see why I didn't just jump in with, quote, organic temper or something more specific. 
Especially in these early days, searching for slightly broader terms will return more results. The good thing is that with more participation, the search function will become a stronger and stronger asset. I'm going to move on now to talking about categories, which I find really satisfying. This is for me the same as looking in a library for a book that I know that I want, and then using that opportunity to read the rest of the titles around that one particular book. This is what I have really been missing from the way that experimental archaeology has been recorded, and it builds nicely on existing practices that we already have, listing our keywords. Starting from that same welcome page, you will see on the left side of the screen, Browse Categories. I'll select Archaeological Evidence Type from this list. Just based on the keywords of those articles from the Exarch Journal publications, you can already see quite a few different subcategories. Beside each subcategory name, you'll see the number of categories nested under it, as well as the number of pages it belongs to. Ceramics has four subcategories and 16 pages, for example. If I want, I can click the blue arrows to see the subcategories. Or, I can just click on Ceramics to view the contents directly. This is certainly not advanced use, but seeing experimental work presented in this way is so rare that the novelty hasn't really worn off for me, and I'm very excited to see how this resource can develop once people start making their own contributions to it. Now, I want to move on to the part where you can help out. If you've watched this far, there's probably a fairly good chance that you've done an archaeological experiment which is not published right now. Every single experimental archaeologist that I've spoken to would appreciate it if you would take about 15 minutes of your time this afternoon and share a little bit of basic data about the work that you've done. You can start the process off by making a username, although you don't have to. There are two forms to choose from, which you can see on the welcome page under the, under the section called to add to the register. These forms help you to get consistent formatting and information within your entry. I'll select the form for the unpublished experiment. The first step is to think of a very simple short title for your experiment. I'll call mine Terra Mare House Urn Forming. I submit that, and the wiki gives me a chance to make a new entry. Now we come to the form itself. I have boxes where I can provide information about my experiment's aims, the experiment hypothesis, the people who were involved in the experiment, whether there were any related experiments, and then any further details about the research program, if there was one, around this particular experiment. The last step is to list your keywords. If there is more information that you wish to share within your entry, then there's a chance to do that as well. Once you are happy with what you've written, you can preview what it'll look like right here. I'm happy, so I can finalize it and then publish it. What I have been presenting today is a starting point. There have been other attempts in the past to make resources like this framework that I have been describing, but none of them seem to be active anymore. What seems to be missing from those earlier efforts is participation. The way for this to work and be sustainable in the long term is for our community to choose to add entries and also step further into keeping things running in the background as well. The more voices who can contribute, the stronger the register will be. Overall, we do have great incentives for participating in this. As a field, we can start to reclaim some of the history of work that has proven so ephemeral. By knowing more about our own history, we can start to apply our scarce time and resources to new questions. We can also start making better decisions about which experiments can and should be done again. Do we have new ways of measuring our results? Do we have new information to influence the experiment design? It's far better to know what came before so that those experiments can have the strongest impact. Finally, one of the points that I especially like here is that we can start to have a more egalitarian approach to the visibility of our experiments. Translation software is increasingly powerful, and by going through this process of presenting my own work in a simple and standard way, I'm making my English language work far more accessible to non-English speakers. 
And the opposite of that is also true. Contributions to the register do not have to be in English. And all that I ask is that you write text that you think translation software can handle. I want to finish up my discussion with a few big thank yous. Firstly, thank you, viewers, for listening all the way to the end. Thank you also to the people who took the time to give feedback early on in this process. Thank you especially to everyone involved with Exarch and the planning who have been so free with their time and their support. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this resource can grow over time, and I hope that everyone listening takes the time to have a look or suggest this to one of their colleagues. I'm very happy to answer questions during the Q&A session in the conference chat, as well as into the future. You can find me on Twitter at the Experimental Potter, the Exp Potter, or send me a message within the wiki itself. Thank you very much for your time.